Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. This is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, Paul writes, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. 
We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried our cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus the Son.
have a seat. Good morning. Everybody's doing well today. So a couple of announcements. We get to start Micah today. That's exciting. Um, but we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today. It's the first Sunday of, uh, of the month, and so we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you have not received the elements yet, they're right there on the middle table there. Uh, you can do that during the welcome. Uh, also, and I didn't realize it was going on. I'm grateful for guys like EJ that I think make it happen. Uh, but there is a meeting room, or in a meeting room uh, here at the Y, if you have uh, kids that, you know, just kind of cranky or whatever, and you don't feel comfortable in here, um, then you can go in there, and there's usually a group of moms and dads and kids and everything else that are actually watching online. And so if that's something that you, would, uh, you could utilize, then that's available. I didn't even know that until this week. So I knew we did it before, but I didn't realize it was still going. Uh, but apparently EJ turns it on every week and uh, gets it going. I think today there's a problem with, um, with our video. There's some kind of software glitz. And so uh, that may not be true today, but, uh, uh, but normally that's what's happening. So uh, new, mem- new members, I know a number of you have asked to join Community Bible Church as church members, and so we will be announcing those next week. Uh, if you would like to explore and be a part of uh, this uh, group of Christians, then there's a, um, on the back table, there's a, a pamphlet called All About CBC that pretty much covers everything that we know and believe and uh, how we function as a church, and so pick that up. There's a covenant at the end that we would have you sign. Uh, and then we would like to meet with you, obviously, before uh, accepting you into membership, which we'll do uh, next Sunday. Uh, right after church today, um, at Jervie Gant Park, uh, we're just doing a picnic in the park. And so we'd love for the whole church to come out. Uh, no need to, it's not a potluck, it's just whatever you would eat for lunch, just bring over there and, and, uh, and come over and, and, uh, and enjoy lunch with us. The pavilion rat is the largest one. It's, it's right off of 36. And so if you find it there on 36, I think there's also an address uh, in the bulletin uh, for that. So I think there's only three pavilions. We're the big one uh, for that. Uh, and then the last thing, um, and we actually just uh, I thought about it last week in hearing about the National Day of Prayer. So National Day of Prayer is always the first Thursday of every month. And normally what happens is Kids gather around a flagpole in their schools and, uh, and at, the, at, the, uh, at City Hall, then a group of folks will come and pray during the lunch period. And I asked Josh, I said, what if we could just come here to the Y and, and, and offer to pray for people on the National Day of Prayer? And so as people come in, we'll say, hey, do you have prayer requests that we can pray for you on in this National Day of Prayer? Uh, and, and would you like us to pray for you right now? Is there anything you want us to talk to you? right now. And so uh, because it's last minute like that, we do need uh, help, obviously, and we didn't recruit because it was kind of a new idea. But if you would just see Josh uh, right after that, we can come anytime. I talked to the Y and they were, they love the idea of having us come in and pray for the people uh, that come here. And so uh, depending on the time that works for you, Josh is organizing all of that, but would love for you to be a part of that. Um, If you are um, visiting with us this morning, Thank you. It's a great week to come because we start a new series, and so you don't have to worry about jumping in the middle of something. Uh, but we'd love to get a record of your visit, and so if you could just fill out a visitor's card there, it should be in the seat back pocket in front of you, uh, and then turn, you can give it to me at the end of the service, or we have a tithe and offering box there in the back. You can put it there, um, but we're grateful that you're here. So let's take a few minutes. Let's stand up, say hello to the folks that have come to worship together with us this morning.
<laughs> All right, friends, as we come back to our seats, we're going we're gonna to spend some time as we move toward uh, the Lord's Supper this morning. Uh, and in this historic Christian practice that uh, the American church, for the most part, has kind of forgotten about, and it's the practice of confession, of being real about how you fail, uh, how we all have failed. Because here's the thing, this church is filled with sinners. Even worse, it's pastored by a sinner. The worst of all is this. <laughs> and the beautiful thing is that God uses, uh, uses us in, in his plan, in his beautiful mission to spread the gospel. And the beginning of the gospel is bad news, right? It's bad news. But then it's good news, greater than we could even imagine. So uh, as, we, as we pray, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to pray uh, the words of David from Psalm 51. Then we're going to sing a song that affirms that. And then as we move into the Lord's Supper, we'll, re we'll remember that the grace has been given to us, that Jesus, whose body was broken, uh, it was broken for us, for our healing, for our wholeness, for our atonement. So let's pray these words uh, all, all together. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. O oh Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. Lord, I
One defense, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need All right, you can have a seat all around the world today. There are Christians who are celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper this morning. There are two ordinances that, that God has given to the New Testament church, that of baptism and that of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we typically do it once a month on the first Sunday of the month. Uh, but I know some churches, they're once every six months and once a year, and other churches are every week. Um, there's, not, there's nowhere does it say how often you are to do it, but it does say as often as you do it. And so uh, we feel like for a church, uh, once a month is, is good for us, um, but no harm if we did it more or did it less. Um, and so this is an opportunity. There's, you know, there's some debate as to what happens with these elements. You know, there's some churches that believe these elements literally turn into the body and blood of, of Christ, the transubstantiation it's called. Uh, we don't believe that. We believe that it's a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so the bread represents his body that was broken for us, and the juice represents the blood that was shed for us. And so that's the uh, theology behind it. Um, what we see in the early church is that this was a common practice, was to share, share and celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together. And so uh, we're going to do the bread first. If you're visiting with us, uh, I always try to explain as well as I can, just because I know it can be somewhat uncomfortable and not really knowing the systems and things like that. And so uh, what we'll do is we'll give a little bit of time for prayer uh, to confess any known sin that you have to God. First John 1 says, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so then as a, as a sign of our unity in Christ, then we will eat the bread together. Uh, we'll do the same thing with the juice as well. And so uh, let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for uh, the body of Christ that uh, was broken for us, a sinless body that didn't have to go undergo the, uh, the scourges of sin and that didn't have to undergo the death um, for man. And yet, he was obedient to the point of death. And so, Father, as we... Uh, just in a moment of quiet, I thank you for Josh and, and him just leading us in confession of sin. And so we confess to you the things that uh, are breaking our fellowship with you. We agree with you that you're right in that and that we are the ones that are wrong. And then we claim, 1 John 1, that if we confess, then you will forgive. So thankful for the forgiveness in Christ, eternal forgiveness and forgiveness for today. Thank you for grace for today. So 
I remember Paul's writing here in 1 Corinthians 11 where he said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so remember the body of Christ this morning. Let's eat together. The cup signifies and symbolizes the the blood of Christ, pure, rich, royal, ruby, red, sinless blood shed on our behalf. And I would add to that, shed on our behalf for his glory, not for ours. Our Father, thank you for the cup. Thank you for this symbol of the blood of Christ that was shed on our behalf. Thank you for the one who went to the cross, who suffered and died, and three days after he died, he rose from death, proving to everyone everywhere that he was exactly who he said he was. He was a sinless God-man, 100% God and 100% man. As God, he could die for an eternal number of people for all of eternity, and as man, he could pay the price that sin deserved. And so Paul would say, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maybe today. Let's drink together. And now, Father, as we open your word to this book of Micah, what a privilege this is to, to begin to study this prophet, kind of a nobody from nowhere, and, and yet a man you use mightily, not just in, in the pre-exilic days, in the days of Jeremiah, um, but in our day as well. And I ask for your help. This is a difficult uh, sermon difficult in uh, this whole series. Um, Romans had its difficulties, but uh, different than what Micah presents. And so I pray that my speech would be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, that I might know how to respond well to each person. I pray that you would use your word and that that word of yours would convict our hearts of sin and righteousness and judgment that we would see the hope in Christ and the grace that's offered. And so use this time to bring honor to your name. Use this time to equip your saints and use this time to win the lost to saving faith in Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. All right, so today we begin the book of Micah. Uh, So open to book of Micah. You're going, where in the world is Micah? So don't be afraid to use your... Table of contents, that's certainly fine. Micah is a uh, minor prophet, it's called, so it's more towards the end of the Old Testament. If you find Jonah, then you'll get to Micah, but Jonah's only four chapters, so that may not be too easy. Um, And then if you find Nahum, so it's between Jonah and Nahum. And when I say that we're going to begin the book of Micah today, I literally mean begin. We're actually only going to get to the first verse today uh, of the first chapter. And you go, man, that's pretty exciting because that means the first verse in the first chapter must be so rich in theological truth and practical application that there's no way that we can do more. Um, That's not true. You're not going to walk away from here this morning with five steps to being a better Christian, ten steps to having a better marriage, none of that stuff. Um, What we need to do this morning is we need to figure out where Micah fits in with the rest of the Old Testament. Because if we don't lay a good foundation, this book will make no sense in all, at all. In fact, when you study an Old Testament book, it's always best to know the background information first. And so you heard me say a few minutes ago that Micah is a minor prophet. So guys like Jonah and Nahum and Malachi uh, and many others as well, they were all considered minor prophets. Then you had major prophets, guys like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Daniel, those were considered major, and major, and then you get Micah, who's considered minor. 
Well, that's kind of a cut down, isn't it? I mean, why are they going to say my man's a minor prophet and call these other guys major prophets? Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with their importance uh, or do they not have major things to say. It has everything to do with being considered minor because they don't have as much material as the major prophets do. And so Micah has seven chapters. Jeremiah has 52 chapters. Isaiah has 66 chapters. And so... He's minor because there's just not a lot of material, not because it's not very important. And so let's just look at Micah 1 and verse 1. I hope you found it by now. I used to have a, 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 a youth ministry leader. He'd say, if you, if you haven't found it, just fake it, you know, because you're not going to find it by now. So um, anyhow, the book of Micah, verse 1, chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord, which came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Doesn't that just warm your heart? <laughs> There's 29 words here, and in these 29 words, we're going to actually start to pick them apart later on in the sermon, but they're 29 important words, and, you know, we need to find out some things about these 29 words, like, like what does the, Micah's name actually mean? Remember, there's an there's a, there's a idea that they, you kind of name your kids based on their character. You know, so what does Micah's name mean? Uh, where's Moresheth? Why is that a big deal? Uh, and then who are all these people in here, right? You get Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. You get a place called Judah and Samaria and Jerusalem. And you go, what does all this mean? Well, if you're visiting with us for the first time, let me just warn you, encourage you, whatever you want to take, however you want to take it, that we just work through books of the Bible one verse at a time. Okay, some weeks we go through just one verse, uh, like this week. Uh, other weeks we'll go through two chapters. Um, like next week, we're actually going to go through chapter one, and then we're going to finish uh, most of chapter two next week. So we'll go from one verse to almost two chapters of, verse, of verses. And so uh, whenever you study the Old Testament, remember, it is so important to know as much background information as possible and where the book fits in within the larger context of the rest of the Old Testament. Okay, so again, this is not one of those sermons where you're going to walk out of here and go, man, I know how to be a better husband as a result of our time together today. It'll actually be a bit educational, okay, a bit uh, academic in that, but I think it's important to go through this in order to get to the real practical stuff that Micah gives us. And so let's look at point number one, if you're taking notes, an Old Testament overview, Okay, an Old Testament overview. So it all starts in the book of Genesis, right? Genesis, the book of beginnings, where God literally creates a six, in six literal 24-hour days um, the whole, everything we know. On day six, it's the crowning uh, joy of his creation where he creates Adam and Eve, and he puts them in this perfect garden in this sinless world to walk with him and live with him. Well, you know the story. Eve is tempted by the serpent, and, uh, and the serpent gets her, tempts her because he's saying, look, this is what God's keeping from you, rather than saying, look how much God is providing for you. And we do that too, don't we? Rather than being thankful for all the things God has done for us and given to us, we focus on the things that, that, he, that he doesn't allow. And so Satan tempts her, Eve is deceived, and, and she sins. Well, then Adam follows suit right behind her. In fact, it says her husband who was with her ate. And so Eve's sin being deceived, Adam knew what he was doing. As a result, uh, her whole earth is cursed and death follows. When you get to Genesis 3, God makes his first promise of a redeemer when he says that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. It'll be a, a death uh, blow to him. And so you have the fall of man and then you have a worldwide flood, and then you have the nations that are established at the Tower of Babel. Fast forward from there to a man named Abraham, or Abram from Mesopotamia, who came from an idol-worshiping uh, home, and God promises him land that he's never seen and more kids than he can count. In fact, he says, from you, Abram, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, the problem with this as the years go on is that both him and his wife are way beyond childbearing years. So 20 years later, Abraham's, Abraham's 100 years old, Sarah's 90 years old, 
and these wrinkled up old people have a baby. Okay, and it's so funny, the idea that these old people would have a baby, that God would be so gracious to them that they, they would give them a son, that they name, a, they name him Laughter. Okay, we know him better as Isaac, but Isaac in the Hebrew means laughter, so they called him the funny man. So Isaac has twin boys, and these twin boys couldn't be more opposite. The first one comes out red and hairy. I think the, you know, the toy that kids play with, that little Elmo, right? Just red and hairy. So what do they call him? They call him Red or Esau. Okay, the name Esau means red. Second one comes out, and he's holding on to Esau's foot. So they call him supplanter or cheater. And man, he lives up to his name and he ends up stealing Esau's birthright. And he runs away because Esau wants to kill him. And in his running, God shows up and Jacob has a wrestling match with the angel of the Lord. And God kind of just deals with him for a while and then he dislocates Jacob's hip. And when he dislocates Jacob's hip, after a night of battling together, he renames him. He says, no longer are you going to be called liar and cheater. No longer are you going to be called Jacob. I'm changing your name to Israel. Israel means one who strives with God or wrestles with God. Well, Israel has 12 sons. And out of his 12 sons, God chooses Judah to be the son uh, whom the Messiah would eventually come through, fulfilling the promise he made back in Genesis 3. Right? Right? And then eventually the nation of Israel gets taken into slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And that's when Charlton Heston or Moses comes on the scene and he, he delivers them and, and, and leads them towards the promised land. But before they get there, then Israel is just a bunch of ungrateful complainers who doubt God's goodness. So instead of a 10-day journey to get from Egypt to the promised land, God makes them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that doubting and complaining generation all dies out. 40 years wandering. In fact, when you, it's, it's pretty interesting when you're reading you know, some of these travels and you, you know, it, God says, I think it's Deuteronomy uh, 1 or 2, and God says, listen, you've circled this mountain enough. Now go north. They're just waiting to die. They're just circling mountains in the wilderness until God uh, kills all of them. Well, Moses dies, and Joshua takes over, and Joshua ends up leading Israel for the next 40 years. And then they conquer the promised land, the land that God had promised to Abraham, right? But when Joshua dies, they're ruled by judges. And judges were kind of like governors who functioned under God's authority. And so you'll hear names like Gideon or, or Samson. They were judges. Deborah was the only woman judge. But Israel's like, we don't want a judge. We don't want a governor that rules under God's authority. We actually want a king like our, all the other nations have. And God's like, you do not want a king. And they're like, no, we want a king. And God says, listen, you do not want a king. And they say, we want a king. And God says, fine, I'll give you a king. And so then he ta tasked the prophet Samuel the job of finding Israel's first king. And Samuel does what probably most of us would do. He looks for tall, dark, and handsome. And he finds a guy named Saul. And he becomes Israel's first king, but Saul wasn't a very good king at all. And so God then anoints a regular shepherd kid named David. And David had some pretty major issues, right? But overall, I think we would agree that David, and among all of the kings, was Israel's greatest king. And oh, by the way, he's also from the tribe of Judah. Well, after David comes his son Solomon who we would consider a good king that made a whole bunch of mistakes. Some people call Solomon the wisest fool who ever lived. And so here's a guy in Solomon who tried everything in, in the world to try to bring happiness to his life. I mean, he didn't deprive himself of anything. And when it was all said and done, he contended and concluded that if you want true peace and true joy and true contentment, you can only find it in God because the rest of it is vanity. And so when David and Solomon were on Israel's throne, those were Israel's heydays. I mean, that, the country was thriving. They prospered in every way imaginable. Eventually, Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam takes over. That's when things really start to go awry. Rehoboam was young and dumb, just like I was when I was young, okay? Just like you were when you were young. 
Um, and so Rehoboam, as he's going to try to figure out how am I going to rule this nation? Am I going to do it like my dad did? Am I going to do it like others have done? And so as he steps up to rule, he first goes to the elders of the land, and he says, he asks them, as elders, hey, would you guys share with me what's the best way to lead this people? And they share with him. And then he goes to his friends, and he says, what's the best way to lead these people? We know his friends are all thinking, man, if, you know, if he's leading our way and I give him the idea, then I'm going to get a whole lot of power and authority and control. And so they give him advice on how to rule. And so he chooses his friends and their advice over the wisdom of the elders. And the nation of Israel then divides into two. And this, listen, this is what you need to grasp, right? The other stuff, it's, it's, it's not filler, but this is what you need to grasp if you're going to get the book of Micah, okay? It, not just Micah, if you're going to understand the major prophets and the minor prophets, and if you're going to read the, the kings and chronicles, like all of that, this is where it's important, right? So Israel ends up with tel- 10 tribes in the north. We'll call them the Yankees, okay? Judah ends up with two tribes in the south, we'll call them the Confederates, okay? So you have the north, you have Israel, and then you have Judah in the south. And there's a really easy way of remembering who's on the north and who's on the south. I comes before J, Israel before Judah. So Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And so when you read Old Testament books, you'll see like, you know, so-and-so was king of Judah. Okay, so is he king of the south? Or is he, um, yeah, is he king of the south or king of the north? South, good. They'll say so-and-so is king of Israel. Well, he's king of the north. And, and, and so when you see that, you'll know that this book is talking about a time when the kingdom of Israel was divided. Does that make sense? Okay, now, the Yankees, the north, right, Israel, had no good kings at all. Not one. So if you ever see somebody as king of Israel, you know what? Bad king automatically he's a bad king. Uh, Think about, uh, remember Jezebel? Her husband was king over Israel, Ahab. Good king or bad king? Yeah, terrible king, right? Um, He was king over Israel during the time of the prophet Elijah. Not a good king. And so Israel only lasts 209 years before they were overtaken by Assyria. By the way, just think about that now, 209 years. We're not a whole lot older than 209 years as our nation, right? Israel, the nation of Israel, prior to being divided, they pretty much ruled everything. Okay, kind of like us, right? Is 209 years, and we're going, they just didn't really last very long, 209 years. We're not a whole lot past 209 years. Why? Why? because there were no good kings in Israel. They turned away from God. So you have Judah to the south, and they have a few good kings, but they don't have many. And so you might be familiar with guys like Uzziah or Hezekiah or Josiah. Those were good kings. They lasted 345 years before Babylon took them into exile. And so Israel was taken into exile by Assyria, Judah was taken into, into, into exile by Babylon. Again, real easy way to remember it, right? Is A before B. Assyria to the north takes away uh, Israel, and Babylon to the south takes away Judah. Okay? Is this making sense? To me, it makes perfect sense, but sometimes it doesn't to others. Okay, good. Just fake it. He just nod. Yeah, you're making sense. Almost done. Um, so... <laughs> So they were a divided kingdom, okay? And what God did during the time when they were a divided kingdom, God sent prophets to them. And the purpose of him sending the prophets was to try to get them to turn back to God. And so Jeremiah and and Isaiah, they were considered what we call pre-exilic prophets. So Assyria, Babylon takes these two nations into exile. So those, before they were in exile, but they were still divided, what happened? Well, they were preached to by different prophets that were pre-exile prophets, pre-exilic prophets. And when the prophets would speak, they wouldn't just speak about what was happening in their day and all the sin that was going on, but they would also give hope and talk about the God bringing the future Messiah, the future Savior to them. 
Well, since they wouldn't respond to God's warnings through the prophets, and since they continued to live in disobedience to God, God allows them to be taken into exile. And then when they were taken into exile, then Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is demolished. And when Israel is in exile, you know what God does? He sends prophets again. And so you have what we call exilic prophets. So like guys like Daniel, he was a prophet during the exile. Guys like Ezekiel prophesied during the exile. Remember the story of you know, Daniel in the lion's den? You remember the, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Where were they at? They were in Babylon. They were in exile at that point. They were under Babylonian rule. Well, as history would go, then eventually the Persians take over both Assyria and Babylon. And so now they've got all these Jews living in there, and they say, hey, you know what? You guys can go back to your land. So God, what does he do? Well, he sends post-exilic prophets to them. Guys like Haggai, guys like Zechariah, guys like Malachi to prophesy. They rebuild the temple. All right, two waves, three waves go back. Ezra rebuilds the temple. But the city is still in ruins because there's no wall. And if there's no wall, then there's no safety. If there's no safety, then nobody's going to live in the city, so there's no homes. If there's no homes, there's no people. And if there's no people, who needs the temple? Because nobody's going to worship there. And that's when God raises up a man named Nehemiah, and he rebuilds the wall, and then the city is rebuilt after that. And things are going pretty good for a while until the people start doing the same sins they did before the exile. And they do that for 400 years, and then Jesus shows up on the scene the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, that's the Old Testament in about 10 minutes. Okay, so now let's look at 1-1 and see if it makes more sense. Okay, the word of the Lord which came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Okay, let me ask you, pre-exilic, exilic, or post-exilic? Not everybody at the same time. It's hard to, you know. Pre-exilic, good. So it's kings of Judah. It's during this time. And then which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Okay, we haven't really talked about Samaria and Jerusalem. So let's look at point number two, the time of Micah. The time of Micah. And so we see guys like Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. They're kings of Judah. Judah's in the north, or, not in the north, Judah's in the south, okay? Um, and he says concerning Samaria. Well, what's Samaria? Samaria was the capital of Israel and Jerusalem, okay? Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Gives us a little information. By the way, the whole alphabetical thing, it falls apart with the capital cities, all right? But it does give us some information here. The capital of the northern kingdom, Israel, was Samaria. The capital of the southern kingdom, Judah, was Jerusalem. And so we see here that Micah is prophesying to both the north and the south. Micah is a pre-exilic prophet prophesying to Israel and Judah. The kings that are mentioned here, guys like Jotham, Jotham was a worthy king, he's called. Ahaz was a heinous king. He was terrible. And then Hezekiah was considered the best of the kings of Judah. Like not better than, than uh, Daniel, because Daniel was the best overall, but as far as kings of Judah are concerned, Hezekiah was considered the best. You remember the story of Hezekiah? It's a fascinating story. He was mortally ill, then Isaiah shows up and tells him to get his house in order because he's going to die. Can you imagine that? Imagine God just saying, hey, just came here to tell you, get everything in order, wash the dishes, you're about to die. So what does he do? 2 Kings 20, he should be on the screen. He says, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, remember now, O Lord, I beseech you how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and I have done what is good in your sight. God, how can you take me home now? I mean, look at all that I've done. I've been faithful to you. He clearly doesn't think that heaven's better than this earth. 
And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, being Isaiah, saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, behold, I will heal you. And on the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you from this city, and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and my servant David's sake. Hezekiah ends up getting 15 more years. By the way, I don't know if you caught it or not, but there's some other names in there that gives us a little bit of insight, right? This tells us that Isaiah was also a pre-exilic prophet, right? Because Isaiah is talking to Hezekiah, and we know that Hezekiah lived during the days of Micah, okay? Remember in Isaiah 6, when God called Isaiah in the ministry? Look at Isaiah 6, 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death... I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling his temple. We normally, like Josh will use that a lot of Sunday mornings. We'll sing about it. We'll talk about it. And, uh, but it's, it's giving a historical evidence here in the year of King Uzziah's death. Well, when did Uzziah reign? Re Uzziah reigned just before Jotham. That Uzziah was a good king. But he made some mistakes, Right? <laughs> He actually was one of the more successful kings. When you read about him, I think it's 2 Chronicles, probably 26. He, you read this story about Uzziah and all these fascinating things are happening. Everything he's doing is successful. He even invents the catapult. And then Isaiah, or Uzziah gets a little too big for his britches and he thinks, you know, I got this. In fact, I, I'm going to go ahead and not just serve in the role of king, but I'm going to serve in the role of priest as well. And so he starts going in to making some sacrifices. And then the priests try to run him out of there. And he is belligerent about it. He thought that he could pridefully play the role of king and priest, and really there's only one who could do that. He ends up dying in it, on his epitaph, just to, on his tombstone, it would probably say, he is a leper. All these great things that he did in his life as king over, over, uh, over Judah... All these great things, when it's all said and done, he's a leper. Listen, guys, there's no filler in the Bible. They're not trying to get to a certain word count in order to be able to pass their essay, right? There's no filler. All of this is important. Just from that, we see, we, we're learning a little bit about Uzziah. We're learning about Isaiah. We're seeing this is all pre-exile. It's not filler, don't just read through it. You get your positioning. See where you're at when you're reading an Old Testament book. Every word is important. Every person is important. It may take a good bit of digging, but it's all important. And so let's look at number three, the person of Micah. The person of Micah. So Micah's name actually means who is like Yahweh. Well, we can answer that, not just from our own study of the scriptures, but certainly from the book of Micah. No one is like Yahweh. He is actually Micah of Morasheth. And when you, read, when you read verse 14, you see that it's Morasheth Gath. Okay, Morasheth was a, was a uh, thriving country town. It was about 21 miles southwest of Jerusalem. Well, I picture Morasheth Gath as bigger than Micanopy and smaller than Ocala. Okay, it was agricultural. Uh, Micah was probably a farmer. God probably called him out from his farm to go to capital cities like Jerusalem and Samaria to declare his word. So wouldn't have that been intimidating, being from a little town like that, and now you're in Jerusalem and Samaria. So Micah would have known the agricultural life, and he also would have been well adapted to life of bartering and the brutality in the city marketplace from having to sell his, his, uh, his agricultural goods. But he could function on both sides pretty effectively. But as you read through the book of Micah, it really seems that he has a heart for farmers and shepherds. Remember Amos. Amos was called the, as somebody who had the heart of a countryman. I think Micah is the same way. Micah has been called in many circles the conscience of Israel. Honestly, we don't really know a whole lot about him. The book covers about 40 to 50 years. We also know that 100 years after he made these prophecies, 
his messages were still being affirmed in Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah. Right, just before the Babylonians came and took away Judah, uh, it was Jeremiah that benefited from Micah's uh, prophecies. Jeremiah, you remember him, he's the one that's known as the weeping prophet. And why did he weep? Well, he wept because of the destruction of Jerusalem they know was coming, uh, the destruction of God's people. But he also had hope for tomorrow. Look at Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Probably, by the way, this is a real familiar verse, I think, for most people. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. This is such a fantastic passage because we use it on, um, on graduation cards. We use it on marriage uh, cards. And we say, hey, God's got this great plan for you. He's going to make you successful. He's going to prosper you. It's completely ripped out of context, isn't it? Because Jeremiah is a pre-exilic prophet. And so what are God's plans for them? You're going into exile, buddy. You're going into slavery. So you put on a, you know, a, a marriage gift card and say, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And some people are going, 70 years of exile. That would be a good way to define marriage, you know? Um, <laughs> or they're going into college or coming out of college. Oh, congratulations, you know, you've got... $100,000 in student loan debts, you're going into slavery. So in that context, it actually would work fine. Um, the point is that Micah's messages had limited success and acceptance in his day. Huge implications later. Okay, it spoke to Jeremiah, certainly, and it also speaks to us today. So let's keep going now. The messages of Micah the messages of Micah. There's actually three messages uh, or cycles, you'll see them called in the book of Micah. And each one of these cycles contain warnings or threats of judgment, and then a hopeful promise after each of these warnings. And, and it's important because really this is the gospel message, isn't it? There's judgment and there's hope. We stand condemned because of our sin and we have hope in Christ. I mean, if you had to work your way into heaven, right? That, that wouldn't be good news. That wouldn't be hopeful. That'd be bad news. How would you ever know if you've done enough? There would always be somebody better. There would always be somebody who did something better. We were down in, uh, in Deerfield Beach and, and uh, on this fantastic boat you know, a couple weeks ago. And, and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. I love this boat. You know, we're going through and went through the intercoastal and there's like $100 million houses, you know, on both sides of us. And, and then as I looked around, I thought, man, their boats are bigger than ours. A lot bigger than ours. And I realized, no matter how big your boat is, somebody's got a bigger one. Somebody's got a better one. No matter how much work you've done to try to earn your way into heaven, somebody's done more. So who do you compare to? I mean, can you imagine being Adam and Eve? They get one command and they break it. They did everything right except for once. And what did God do as a result? Well, two things. Look at Genesis 3, verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So in other words, he judged them, right? But then he also extended grace by sacrificing an animal to make garments to cover up their nakedness and to cover up their shame. But what else did God do? Genesis 3, 22, he says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned from every direction to guard the way of the, to the tree of life. And so God's judgment of sin is followed by his gift of grace. And the gift of grace to Adam and Eve was to kick them out of the garden. That was the best thing God could do because if they were to eat from the tree of life being in a separated state from God, then they would have lived forever separated from God with no chance for redemption. And so Jesus solved that problem when he died once for all time. 1 Peter 3, verse 18, he says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Like once for all, Old Testament, New Testament, our church age. He died once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, 
but made alive in the spirit. And so our hope is in the sufficiency of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. And so you get these three cycles in Micah, and that's what it's all about. In the first cycle, the people of Israel are, are, are threatened with exile because of their sin. We'll deal with that next week. That's the judgment portion. When you get to 2.12, you're going to see that God is going to, uh, has, has gathered, is going to gather his chosen remnant there in Jerusalem. That's the hope. Ultimately, they're going to survive the siege, and the Lord will become their king. And so when you get to Micah's second message, Judah stands condemned because they had all these corrupt judges, and these judges would disregard the pleas for the oppre- of the oppressed. And then they had all these false prophets who claimed to hear from God, and it wasn't from God. And Judah had these wicked leaders who built up the city, and, and they used blood money to do that. And we're going to see in chapter 3 that God uh, disregards the pleas of the judges. And so you got these judges who are ruling, and God says, I'm not listening to you. And he, le- he purposely left the prophets in darkness. They're asking for answers, and God gave none of them. In fact, he tore down everything the rulers built. That's the judgment. And then you get to chapter 4, and you see hope. And Micah starts talking about the peaceful latter days of the Messiah. And then when you get to Micah's third message, Judah goes back to God's courtroom to charge them for being so ungrateful for all that God had done for them. I mean, he freed them from slavery. He gave them godly leaders. He blessed them rather than cursing them. He performed miracles to clear the way for them. And their response was they worshiped hypocritically. They faked the devotion to God. I mean, they show up at the temple to mark it off their checklist, and they had everything done, and they were doing the right things with wrong motives, which was not unfamiliar to what the world that Isaiah lived in, right? Look at Isaiah chapter 1. In verse 10, and we'll fly through this, but he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. By the way, Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed long before this. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. Wait a second. Didn't God require all of these things? All these sacrifices? God said, I want you to do these things. And now God says, I've had enough of them. I take no pleasure in them. And he says, well, when you come to fear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. By the way, the same ones that God told them to do. Nothing wrong with the feasts and the festivals. It's the way you're doing it. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. He says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the message. This is the same time period that Micah is writing in. Do you see how it's, why it's important to kind of understand where we're at in the Old Testament if we're going to open up an Old Testament book and read it? Can you see why this is vital to really understanding truth? It's easy to get uh, wrapped up in the trap of, of rote religion where you're just going through religious motions, but there's no real genuine love for God that overflows in love for others. And so how does Micah conclude? Probably the, the most famous verse in Micah's in the book of Micah, Micah 6, verse 8, he has told you, O oh man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Which is what Isaiah just said. He just had more words for it. What do you do when the people of God are living, as the people of God, are living among sinful people? 
and you have wicked religious leaders, and you have unjust judges, and you have sinful leaders and corrupt politicians, what are you to do? Do justice, love mercy, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. And I would say you are responsible for you. Quit blaming everybody else. And so let's look at the last one here, number five, the encouragement of Micah. You know, there's a tendency when you read a book like this to get kind of trapped and caught up in the history of it. And you see God's judgment on Israel, but really the book of Micah is a story of God's redemption in Jesus Christ. It's gonna take us about eight weeks to work through Micah. My prayer through it all is that Jesus is exalted above all else. Jesus is the message of Micah. He's the good shepherd of his sheep. He's the godly king from eternity and from Bethlehem. And he is the great high priest who atoned for the sins of his people. The name Micah, it's a very common name in the Bible, 14 of them. And the one who penned this book is virtually unknown. In fact, he's only mentioned twice in the Bible. Let's look at Jeremiah 26, verse 18. It says, Micah of Morasheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and he spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus the Lord of hosts has said, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become ruins, and the mountain of, his house, of the house of the high place of a forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? What's the answer? No, they didn't. Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord, and the Lord changed his mind about the misfortune which he had pronounced against them? But we are committing a great evil against himself. And so in context of Jeremiah, what we see is Micah's messages from 100 years before, they saved Jeremiah's life. The people, as they were kind of going to judge and, and consider Jeremiah, they concluded that we can't put Jeremiah to death because Jeremiah is saying the same things Micah did. We can't kill Jeremiah because he's not being inconsistent with the rest of the word of God. How bold Jer Jeremiah was. In, a, in our world, this is so critical in a, in a day that we have pastors and church leaders compromising on the very truth of Scripture, the plain things of Scripture, because they don't have the guts to just say what's been said for millennia. But we feel, there our filter for truth is this, right? It's not what I feel or what our culture is saying or what's, what we think... Uh, our opinion is. It's not because it's going to get us in trouble or keep us from getting in trouble. We preach this. This is the word of God. Micah preached the word of God. Jeremiah then went back and preached exactly what Micah did. He had guts to do it. The people wanted him killed. And then they said, we can't kill him because this is consistent with the message of, that Israel's had for years. Mark Dever, when he, he recalls Micah, and he says, reading these sermons from Micah are like reading the sermons from a nobody who was from nowhere. But the themes of Micah seem to be taken from our news. And so when you look at the issues of injustice, when you look at the oppression of the poor, when you look at abuse of power and the exploitation of the innocent, that was Micah's day, and that's our day as well. And you know what else is a major theme in the book of Micah? Is repentance. Repentance and the promise of forgiveness. And, and honestly, listen, not, not many people preach the book of Micah. When, when, when I approached the elders about Micah, the, one of the big reasons I wanted to do it, wanted to preach it because I felt like it was so uh, common in our day. And it's hard to find preachers who preach through Micah. It's not a popular thing. It's a lot of judgment. It actually comes across fairly harsh, and I don't want to do that but I'm going to preach what Scripture says. It's not like, you know, preaching a book like Jonah is kind of fun because, man, you get this guy that's, you know, in sin, and then, yeah, throw me off. You want your life to be good? Just throw me into the water. He gets swallowed up by a big fish, and, you know, all of Nineveh then repents, you know. That, that's fun to preach. Micah's like, you're hosed. Like, for years, your life's going to really stink for a long time. But there's hope, but it'll be a while. Like, those aren't popular messages to preach. And yet I can tell you, 
Just as sure as God used Micah's words thousands of years ago, I am certain that he's going to use it in our lives today. And so here's my challenge for us, the church. Would you commit this week to reading seven chapters of Micah, all seven chapters, one chapter a day, all you need, one chapter a day, and you can get through the book of Micah. It'll raise questions for you. I think it'll open your eyes. You go, oh, man, that's pretty interesting where Judah was at. You know, Micah had a lot of guts to say, and then you'll come across, you go, okay, there's the hope there. One chapter, you guys will do it, right? We're going to check you next week and make sure. Let me pray for us. Our Father, thank you so much for this book of Micah. Thank you for this minor prophet with a major voice in our lives. God, I pray for us as a church that as we look at these things and and really begin to see our own culture in it uh, and to see our own personally where uh, where we land on some of these things, God, that you would give us a conviction that we will stand by the truth of your word and not be swayed by what our Uh, society says, our culture says, our community says, but instead we would hold fast to the word of truth. And so, Father, I pray for a special boldness among God's people, a commitment to your word, and a commitment to honoring and obeying you um, as we begin to work through this book together. I thank you for uh, the opportunity this morning to preach. I thank you for the strength uh, to preach it today. I pray for our time together at this picnic that you would use it to strengthen our fellowship with one another and our love for one another. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you are here this morning and you're curious about salvation, being saved, what it means to go to heaven, then I would invite you, there's double doors there. Just go through those double doors. There'll be somebody there to meet with you. Uh, If you need prayer over whatever, uh, or you just wanna talk to somebody, that's a great resource there. So I would invite you to go there. Uh, as we sing this, uh, these last closing verses. Amen. All right. Well, let's stand together. I want to teach you a chorus, a new song that just came out uh, right when Pastor Micah told me that we were going to go into Micah uh, a few months ago. This song was released, and it's a setting of Micah 6-8, and it uses different portions of Scripture. I love that we can sing. We pretty much at CBC just sing straight Scripture. So I'll let you uh, be the ones to figure out where the other verses and things are found in the Bible from the New Testament and from the Old Testament. But this is how the chorus goes. Before we we play the whole song together, I want you to teach you this chorus. And it just says this, um, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God in all things and all ways, walk humbly with you, God. And as we think about Jesus' example, he's the one who perfectly demonstrated acting justly loving mercy and walking humbly. Okay. This is how the chorus goes. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with you, God, in all things, in all ways, walk humbly with you, God. Let's try it together. Act justly, love mercy, Walk humbly with you, God, in all things, in all ways. Walk humbly with you, God. Beautiful. All right, we'll do that together.
and years from now we'll see the fruit our hands have sown. Faith just like a seed, the only way it grows. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with you, God. not be burned. We will not be burned by the fire. He is the Lord our God. We are not consumed by the blood of hell. In the dark of night, before the dawn, my soul be not afraid, for the promised morning, oh how long, oh God of Jacob, be my strength, we will be in the house. broken every vow we've broken and betrayed you are the faithful one from the garden to the That is our hope. We will be feasting outside today, and it's, it's, we're feasting as a sign of the kingdom that we have reconciliation with each other and with God um, at a picnic together. My friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.